Hi folks, uh, this is Richard Hall uh, from Stonehenge Artero and this is the, the night sky uh, we'll be doing at the moment. So, and I've also got Kay with me. Say hello Kay. Hello everybody. And we've got that other twerp with us as well. Obviously. Yes, the other twerp. <laughs> Keith it's Austin. Keith. How are you? Our musician. Oh, hello <laughs> Keith. Okay folks, so we're going to just look at some of the interesting things in the night sky at the moment. If you can see them, of course, with the current weather that we're having at the moment. So as we start off, I guess the first thing everyone would notice as you're, uh, even before it gets really dark, is that brilliant star that you can see in the northwest, right? Well, that's the evening star. And of course, it's no star at all. It's actually the planet Venus in the sky. And Venus is the b most brilliant star-like object. If you know where to look, you can actually see it in broad daylight. But you only ever see Venus in the evening sky, just after sunset in the west, or in the morning sky in the east. And the reason for that is because it's closer to the sun uh, than the Earth is. And consequently, we never see it in a backdrop of stars. So that's Venus that you can see. But Venus is not the only planet in the sky there. There is another one there. OK, so there's Venus. And the other one is the planet Mars. And it's a little bit difficult. It's reasonably bright, as shall I say, but uh, it doesn't sort of stand out at all. And that's the reason is that the brightness of Mars as we see it depends how close we are. Now, when when we're really close to Mars, what we call it opposition, it's a really brilliant object. Right now, the Earth has scooted away from it and it's faded away, all right? And the only thing you notice, it's got this reddish colour, but it's slowly moving against the background stars. And the reason why there's that difference in the, um, uh, in the, the variation, I should say, in the distance between the Earth and Mars or the Earth and Venus is because, of course, we're all go they're all going around the Sun and occasionally the orbits have the planets close to each other and sometimes they, they're on the other side of the Sun from us and, and uh, so they're further away from us. Yeah. So they appear dimmer and smaller. When, when you consider that, you realise just how difficult it was for our ancestors who knew nothing about the Earth going around the Sun. Yes to try and work out what the hell was happening up there, <laughs> you know? Anyway, that, so those are the two, the two planets that you can see in the sky at the moment, right? Now, near to that, if you could, particularly if you've got a pair of binoculars in where Venus and Mars is, you look there and you'll see something we call the beehive. Uh, with the unaided eye, perhaps with a pair of binoculars, it looks like a fuzzy block, but it's actually a, a cluster of stars called the beehive cluster. And for those of you watching this on TV, I've just brought a, um, a picture of it up. Now, the, the beehive contains roughly a thousand stars in a volume of space just 15 light years in diameter. Now, I'll get this in context. For those of you looking at that picture, remember cluster stars are not, they're all different brightnesses from stars which are thousands of times brighter than the sun to those that are thousands of times fainter. So when you see this photograph, most of the stars that capture your eye are the big giant stars. But most of the other stars in the background, they're also members of the cluster. But when it's just a thousand stars in a volume of space, 15 light years in diameter, if you take an area 15 uh, light years in diameter, or, you know, with the sun sitting at the centre, where we are, there's six stars. So can you imagine what it would look like on a planet going around one of those stars with a thousand stars in that same sort of I area? I was just thinking, <laughs> what, would, what would our night sky look like if we were in the middle of that cluster? Yeah. It would look really spectacular. It's not only that, case; it's also the fact that uh, being so close together at this stage, because stars are warming clusters, right? Yes. Um, and they disintegrate with time. But of course, at the moment, they're so close, close encounters between the stars will not be unusual. And, you know, you could, if you're not lucky, your planet could be thrown out of space, into space somewhere. Yeah. By the forces of gravity. Yes, of course, absolutely. Each star has its own gravitational field and they interact with each other. Yeah. Those pretty blue ones are much, much hotter than ours, eh? They're Absolutely, the, bl the blue ones are, 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 are blue giants within there. Mm. Yeah, and they're probably sort of, you're looking at tens of thousands of times brighter. The orange ones are also giants. But they're, di they're dying, they're aren't they? They're dying stars, yeah, because mm -hmm. what happens when a star expands and its temperature drops, that's going to happen to the sun. So they were bigger than 
Those oh, blues. Yeah, they're bigger, mm. yeah, but they're giant stars. But having a lower temperature, surface to surface area, they're mm. not radiating quite so much. But they were bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And look, this is a lovely little cluster. You only need a pair of binoculars and you can begin to pick it up and see it, all right? So in the easy way of finding it, look for Venus and Mars and then you'll, you'll find it. And actually, I think it was Venus uh, just recently actually passed right in front of the, the cluster, all right? Yes. So that's where it is at the moment. So that's the beehive cluster that we can see there at the moment. Okay, all right. It's distance. It's 577 light years. I, I always find these interesting when I give you out these distances. These days, 577. How on earth do they get it so accurate? Well, it's actually with things like the James Webb Telescope, which is able, and the satellites we have, which can measure things so much more accurately. Mm. And its age is 650 million years. Now, you might think that's old, all right? Uh, but, you know... <coughs> 650 million years, that's 4 billion years younger than our sun, all right? So those are comparatively new stars. Yeah, they're, they're babies, they're babies. Yeah. babies. And yeah. some of them have already died. Yeah, yeah, that's what the giants, yeah, they don't last very long. And just remember that in the past, our sun was part of a cluster like that. It wouldn't have shone blue, though. Would have no, just, oh, no, no. It wouldn't be, have been able to see it very easily, and it'd no. just be one of those dots. Yeah, that's right, in the background. Mm. And uh, astronomers have actually been searching to try and find our brothers and sisters. Now, I think they've, they've detected at least one. And how they've done that is actually because the path it has around the galaxy, but also the chemical composition of that star would be virtually identical to our sun. Because it would have been the nebula that they're all that's formed right. from. Yeah. 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 Yes. Now, by the way, the... Um I've had people ask me, how do, uh, how, how do we know the chemical composition of stars which are hundreds or thousands of light years away? And the simple answer is by looking at the spectrum, which is all the light produced by the star, spread out into a rainbow from red, all the way from red to violet. And each type of atom in the star chemistry is just atoms, um, generates a particular frequency of light, a particular colour of light. And so by looking at the most distant stars and splitting the light into that spectrum, that rainbow, we can actually tell what sort of atoms are, um, are, are, are in that star. Absolutely, yeah. And it's like a so fingerprint. We're, so yeah. we're looking for a, a solar analogue, um, a star like the sun, which has almost the same um, metal content as uh, as our sun does, and you say we've actually found one. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It works a bit like a um, when you go to the supermarket and they've got a barcode on something. Yeah. It's like a light barcode, and also encoded in that is the temperature of the star as well. You know, mm. yeah. And that's when you look when we like Kay was saying earlier, the blue ones are hotter. As, <laughs> and you, you tend to think of blue as being cold. It's just that normally, a, a, you see, if you heat something up. It goes from mm -hmm. red hot to orange to yellow, yes. which is the colour of our sun. We don't tend to get much beyond that because mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't create temperatures that are low. But it would eventually go white and eventually blue hot. Right. And then ultraviolet. You yeah. get it with lasers and I, stuff, um, don't you? Yeah. I used to, I used to work in a forge when I was um, when I was in my teens, and I learnt I was taught how to tell the colour of the metal in the forge, in the furnace, by the, uh, by the colour that it gave off. Yeah. And you get a dull crimson red, then a bright red, then orange, and then yellow, and then the, then the metal melts, yeah. of course. But it's the same thing. It tells you the temperature of the star. Yeah. And it's just something to bear in mind, is when, when we're talking about looking at colours, the, your eye, and same as mine, has got two different types of cells on it, all right? And one gives us coloured vision. These are called rods and cones. And the cones give us yes. coloured vision, and the rods give us black and white vision. But the rods are far more sensitive. So at night, when the light level drops down, we're using mostly rods. And that's why when you go out into your garden at, no at night, all the beautiful colours that you could see in the daytime, all the flowers and plants, they're all gone except the brightest ones. Now, exactly the same thing applies to the stars. 
in most cases the light coming from a star is too feeble to trigger the cone cells in your eye so you tend to see stars white so all stars look white yeah, yeah. except with a small number of very big ones like Antares and so on which have got an orangey color you do take that I think it's training because I can remember you telling me about the colors of stars and I looked up and you thought didn't believe me did you no I thought this is emperor <laughs> with no clothes you know there's just nah <laughs> They're all the same. But uh, after a while, you do actually pick up the tint. Yeah. So yeah. don't be surprised if you can't see it at all in the beginning. <laughs> That's right. But of course, what, what, once you amplify the amount of light coming through your eye, like looking through binoculars and even further, a big telescope, and the bigger the telescope, more, the more and more those colours begin to come through. Yes. Okay. So something, something to bear in mind. Okay. Right. So that's the beehive that we can see at the moment. And directly next, almost due north, is the sickle in the sky, the sickle of stars. I think I've talked about this last month, that the rising of those stars uh, in Europe <clears throat> hundreds of years ago signaled the time to bring in the harvest. All right? mm. And, of course, the sickle is, forms part of the mane of the lion. All right? My favourite constellation. <laughs> the lion yeah leo okay so there's leo and of course uh, for those watching it on tv yes the lion is upside down but as i've pointed out so many times before all these constellations were named and pictured in the northern hemisphere and down here they do all appear upside down so there's the lion there okay and uh <coughs> Here's, and that's of course part of the zodiac and I've just brought up the zodiac signs and you can see that in fact uh, Mars is in um, Cancer the Crab and Venus is down there, it's in uh, Gemini all right? but remember a planet and that's the importance of the zodiac is the constellations that lay along the plane of the solar system so the sun, the moon and all the planets all appear to move through the signs of the zodiac yeah. Yes, along the curve of the ecliptic. That's right, yes. yes. yeah. Yes. So that's the zodiac. Now, if we turn around and look to the south, in the early evening around about 7 o'clock, the Southern Cross is reaching its highest point in the sky. Uh, and remember, you always work out the Southern Cross by those two bright stars that follow it around called the two pointer stars. Right. So those are the two behind, and it follows the cross around the sky. And of course, from here, the cross never sets. It's its highest point. <clears throat> Six months from now, roughly the same time, it will be upside down, down near where it says south at the moment on your screen. Okay. So that, but next to the Southern Cross, and you can pick this out with the unaided eye, because you've got the Milky Way there, but you'll notice a bright patch just to the right of the Southern Cross. All right. For those of you watching this one, I just brought it up. And this is the Eta Carinae Nebula. Yes. And a nebula means um, essentially a cloud, right? But this is a glowing cloud. And what we've actually got here is one of the nearest and most awesome regions where stars right now are being formed. You don't see so much of it on a, uh, in, a, in most astronomy books. And the reason is... Most astronomy books are written in the Northern Hemisphere and you can't see it from the North, all right? But this is absolutely spectacular. So let's have a, a quick, quick look at that, okay? Here, I've just put up a photograph of the nebula itself, all right? And it says there its distance is 8,500 light years, all right? And it's, that, that cloud you're looking at is 460 light years in diameter. Now remember when I say 8,500 light years away, you're seeing it as it was 8,500 years ago, okay? Mm. But when looking at the nebula, there's two things, you realize, what we call light and dark. Dark is simply because it's, you've got cosmic clouds. And these cosmic clouds blot out the light and more distant stars. So it just appears dark. But where you've got really hot blue stars nearby, the intense UV radiation from them ionizes the gas and it begins to glow. And that's when you see all these different colors, which are also related to the chemical properties. of. It's thing. just like your neon lights and the advertising signs, yeah. eh? That's what Eating up. Yeah. Yeah. The electrons excite the atoms in the gas and yeah. Yeah. cause the gas atoms to give off photons of light, which yeah. we see as a glow. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so let's go and have a look. 
Now, in the outer regions, you've got these dark clouds I'll talk about. And here's a famous one, of course. This is Mystic Mountain, which was originally seen by the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And now we've got more detailed ones coming through the James Webb. But it's a great column of gas and dust, right? which has been sculptured where the lighter stuff has been driven away by the radiation from the stars. So there's Mystic Mountain there. How, uh, how, how big would that be, the Mystic Mountain? Light years in there. Light I, years. I don't have it on top of my head, but we're talking about light years. Exactly. Yeah, it's not a little thing. Yeah. Now, as you get to know within the central region, you get these hot, intense regions which are, are being um, illuminated by hot stars. The different colours representing different elements that it's picking up depending on the radiation. But near the centre of Carina, we've got this huge star cluster. Now, this is something on a scale much, much larger than what we were looking at before with the beehive. We're looking at one which has got literally tens of thousands of stars there, and with thousands of them, uh, tens of thousands brighter than the moon itself. But there, there you can see this cluster for those who watching it on TV. But reason why it's called the Eta Carinae Nebula is because there is a star there called Eta. Yes. <laughs> you see now astronomers when they used to map out a constellation they used to call the brightest star Alpha, the second brightest Beta. These are Gamma Delta. <laughs> the letters of the Greek alphabet. That's right yeah. That's so this is Eta. Yeah. But Eta is a is a w awesome star right. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Eta. Uh, there, there are, here it comes up now. Here's Eta now. Okay, there it is. Now this star is five million times brighter than the sun. It is perhaps, if not the brightest star that we can see in the Milky Way galaxy. Five million suns. That's right. Yeah. It has yeah. the brightness of five million suns. That's right. Okay, now, what was brought to our attention is that a little while ago, um, there was an eruption, uh, 1843, there was an eruption on this star, and there was no eruption because Eta can normally can only be seen, you know, it can be seen with the naked eye, but it's, it's not a particularly bright star in the nebula. But suddenly this star shone out just about as bright as any bright star, the brightest stars in the galaxy. And what had occurred it was a, a titanic explosion had occurred on this star. Right? Now, since that time, it's faded down. And um, we can't actually see the star, or most of the time, because it's actually surrounded by gas and dust. But for those of you watching this on TV, you can see the wreck of that explosion. Two great bubbles, one going out its north pole and the other at the south pole. And then you can also roughly then work yes. out the I was going equation. to ask why there are two bubbles. So yeah. One has erupted from the north pole of the star and the other from the south pole. Well, there's an yes. eruption, but what's yeah. happened is that because you've got uh, the magnetic, the way in which the magnetic fields work, yes. it's easier for the matter to escape north and south. And that's those bubbles that you can see there. Would that, and it's still would that have been a nova eruption? A, a no, well, it was a big eruption. A nova in these days is normally we know as a as a dying star. This is no dying star. Yeah. I'll let you know what we know. Right? Five million times the sun. Right? We know it's a binary star, and we've got two stars which orbit out around each other in a period of five and a half years. One of them has one hundred and twenty times the mass of the solar system. The other sixty times. Now these are colossal stars. Are they going to combine? Because they're very close. Well, they're very close. But what we do know is that the, the rate of energy they're going, they're likely to explode at any time. And when they explode, it won't just be a note like we've seen before. I mean, this thing will be clearly visible in broad daylight. And we're just hoping that the, what did we say, five and a half thousand light years is far yes. enough away from it. Okay. <laughs> So the answer is, okay, one of the, obviously the brighter one will explode first, uh, that will free up and then eventually another one. But what will form from that big one that bites up is a black hole. Because right? Right. these big, big, massive stars, both of them ultimately will end up as black holes. Yeah. And these are the two stars in the middle of the Eta Carinae Nebula. Yeah, that's right. So, so a nice, close black holes. Eh? <laughs> nice, close black holes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It says, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow my house down. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what's going to happen with these two stars. So just keep your eyes open on that. Yeah. Now, at the moment, um, were you going to play some music for us, Keith? Um, yes, it's up to you. 
Well, or we can carry on yakking. What we've got only got about another three or four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what what's going to be this? Oh, look, look, I will finish off by doing the in the stars, and we'll see how we go. At the moment, of course, we've got a very bright moon around, which is blotting out the Milky Way and everything else. So, if you want to really see these deep spacings, head out for times when um, there's no bright moon around. Okay. Yes. Now let's have a look at the full moon. It's actually quite interesting, right? So here we've got a little picture of the come up of the moon, and um, what you, you can pick out even the eye is dark and bright patches on the moon, and these are permanent, all right? But the interesting thing, if you were to strip all the oceans and atmosphere off the Earth, you would see exactly the same thing, because the dark patches are lower. They are made of basalt, and the ocean floors of our of our planet are made of basalt as well. The whiter rocks are lighter, which the continents are made out of. Basalt is a um, igneous rock. Volcanic rock, yeah. Volcanic, yeah. It's a volcanic rock. Yes. So if you could strip all the if you could strip off all the atmosphere and water off the Earth, it would look much like the Moon with these dark and white patches. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, let's get it in perspective. Here I'm showing you the Earth and Moon to scale, right? Now, as you can see, the Earth is a lot bigger, right? But um, actually, it's also the Moon is made up of lighter material. The Earth has got a big core of iron in it, right? If you put them on scales, the Earth is 81 times heavier than the Moon, right? So, and that's why it has six times the gravity of the moon. And also why it has no atmosphere, all right? Because once upon a time, the Earth would have looked like the moon. and what, But what's happened is that the atmosphere of the moon has been lost into space because of its low gravity. Okay? I was just reading yesterday that they're a bit worried about very large um, space vehicles landing on the moon and creating... Um, dust and clouds and things like that and of course it doesn't settle yeah. very easily it just floats around and you end up with this you know problem now if you look at the moon through a telescope and i, I was showing you a picture here for those who can see it, you see that there's lots of craters but there's far more craters on the white areas than the dark areas and this is telling you something they're older the dark areas are much younger yes the white yeah, areas the are, white areas are yeah. older and, and indeed they are. All right? So this is volcanism that has occurred afterwards. And the craters that you can see is, is simply since the, that has frozen over, that area there. Okay? They're kind of flood basalts, aren't they? They come up and sort of just oh, like yeah. a big oozy thingy yeah. and spread. On a scale that we don't see anymore. No, we did have. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. The Deacon traps or something. Yeah, yeah they, they were flood yeah, that's basalts. Right. Yeah. yeah. So when you look at the moon... It's covered in craters. We see virtually no craters on the Earth, and there's a good reason for that. We've got an atmosphere. You see, if eroded. we didn't have an atmosphere, there'd be just as many craters on the Earth as there is on the Moon. It's just that on the Earth, they all get eroded away. Craters there could have formed, you know, billions of years ago, and they're still in pristine also condition. also the fact that the meteorites that uh, cause these craters, uh, most of them burn up in the, in the Earth's atmosphere. Absolutely. There is yeah. no atmosphere on the Moon, yeah. so... That's right, yeah. Exactly. So anyway, look, we'll have a look at the Moon in later, in more detail at a later time. Mm. Let's look at... And there's a, a wonderful photograph I've just put up for you. There's the man on the Moon there, all right? And he's heading towards, can you see his, the vehicle he's heading oh, that's, towards? Oh, that's one of my holiday snaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How many people have been on the moon? It's not that many, is it? I actually can't remember the number these days. It was, uh, it was 70, 1974. Yeah. Was the, yeah. uh, was the last lunar landing. Yeah. Anyway, folks, just finish off now, yeah. is that uh, if you want to see more about the moon, the place to go to is Avatoy, uh, their official opening of their exhibition, The Moon, Then, Now and Beyond, is uh, official opening is on June the 16th. I've been there. It's They've got fabulous. This of the moon. It's absolutely fabulous. But it's, make your way down and have a look. Yeah. It's a blown up moon. Yeah. And it just yeah. keeps turning. It's yeah. the most fantastic thing. Well, it's you stand big, there and watch it it's revolving. As, it's as big as the room. And in. you can walk around it. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's our toy. So let's go now, our toy. Um, 
Just to remind you that Stonehenge, we're in the winter months now. We're just open on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., except when we've got special events occurring. And we do have Star Treks, which have to be booked, but we'll take you around the heavens. But we also do guided tours. Yeah. We do all the things that you have to book for our guided tours, the Star outside. Treks. Yeah. yeah, those all have to be booked, but they can be done at any time by arrangement. Yeah. And finally, to leave you, we have the winter solstice coming up at the shortest day of the year, and we're going to be doing a special program, as we always do, on the legends of the winter solstice. 4 p.m. Thursday, June the 22nd, is, is that's when the solstice occurs. That's when we're going to be Keith doing it. Keith? Oh, yes. Uh, for, yeah. The reason it's 4 p.m. is because we're winter. The sun sets, and we want you to be able to see the sunset at the winter solstice. I think there might be another man with some singing bowls yeah. too. They're the bowls that you put your finger around the inside of it. They come from Tibet or something like that, and they make a most beautiful sound. Mm. So what we've got is a, a sunset mm. presentation. We've got live music, and we're going to have stargazing afterwards. So Yeah, so it should be fun because... The good thing about, I've always wanted singing bowls because that way you don't have to be a musician, you know, a practising musician to make music. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, we're going to have to shut up now because I think we've had our, our time. Last. Are you going to pipe us out, are you? Thank you.